you know it now. <laughs> Don't have to feel bad when I choose it anymore. Today's scripture passage, I want to quote in a Luciano Pavarotti voice, <laughs> just for a little bit of dramatic effect. Now, I'm not sure if the young people, not that there are many, but that the two young people in church today will know who Luciano Pavarotti is, so we must come up with another option. Um, Yanni Moore? <laughs> uh, okay, perhaps somebody more uh, impressive and illustrious than that. How about Kay Corson? Is he still remembered fondly? Hey? Can I say what I want to say with the Kay Corson voice? Hey? Okay, you know what? It's not actually going to work because I'm not white. So, I think what we're going to do, I'm going to say it and you're going to imagine it in a Gay Corson voice. Is that a deal? Okay, so here's the scripture passage for this morning. Here is my servant, in whom I delight, my servant whom I love. My spirit is on him, a bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. How did that go in your mind? Did it sound like a song? Let's not spend too much time on this Hay Corson business. I want to jump right in. Who can tell me where those verses come from? Perhaps this time round I must just give them to you in a better voice, okay? Here is my servant whom I love, in whom I delight. My spirit is on him. A smoldering wick he will not snuff out, and a bruised reed he will not break. Any takers, where do those words come from? From Psalms. Who sang Psalms? Sabi, put down your hand because you're wrong. <laughs> it comes from the Old Testament, it comes from the prophet Isaiah, and if you've been to church over the last three Sundays, we will, you would have known that, because we are busy with a series of Isaiah prophecies. <laughs> three weeks ago, I started this journey of prophecy as we unpacked Isaiah 7, verse 14. Remember the prophet promising that one day a virgin would have a child, and he would be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. The week after that, we zoomed in on Isaiah chapter 9, where we also looked at the foretelling of Messiah, who would be known as the mighty God, the wonderful Father, or the everlasting Father, the wonderful Counselor, and the Prince of Peace. And then last week we went into the exilic passages for Isaiah 40 was preached during the Babylonian exile. And we looked at verse 9 of that chapter, Sabi. <laughs> Verses 9 to 11 where it says, And he shall feed his flock like a shepherd, and he will carry them in his bosom, and he will gently lead those who are with young. Am I the only one remembering my sermons? <laughs> and so today I want to wrap this up for us by giving you something from Isaiah 42 verses 1 to 6. The passage is in the first person and it sounds awfully familiar. Where we hear something very similar is of course in Matthew chapter 3 at the baptism of Jesus. Where this thunderous voice comes from heaven, affirming Jesus. Some people speak of Jesus' baptism as his ordination. Where he was set apart for that sacred mission to which only he would be called. And we hear this voice as the dove, the, in the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove descends on Jesus. And says, this is my son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. Can you believe that these words that I have now dug up from the Old Testament 600 years before Jesus, not all, 
became confirmed at that moment where Jesus was dumped in the Jordan by John the Baptist. There's something in today's passage that I want to particularly look at when we preach about the baptism of Jesus in January, we will talk about how God affirms Jesus by saying, Here is my son, here is my servant, he makes uh, my son, my servant, he makes me happy. I want to go down in Isaiah 42, and I want to pause getting to verse 6. For there is something there that has just wrapped itself around my heart. It's that space where it is said that Jesus would come and he would never snuff out a smoldering wick. And that he would never break a bruised reed. I just feel that because we've done the whole Yanni Mulma thing and take courses, in, that I have to repeat that in Afrikaans. Well, so here goes. A gekneeste riet sal hy nie breek nie, of a geknapte riet sal hy nie breek nie. En a kers wat dof brand sal hy nie uitblaas. We often hear sermons on the spectacularness of Jesus. When we scratch around in the Gospels, we often get passages that make us go ooh and ah. Passages that overwhelm us. Passages that leave us standing in awe and wonder. We, we have Jesus calming the storm, for instance, with one single sentence. We have Jesus feeding a crowd of 5,000 men. That's not even counting the females and children. We have Jesus being impressive, Jesus showing his power, Jesus flaunting his supernatural ability. We don't often come eyeball to eyeball with Jesus, the compassionate Jewish rabbi. Long ago, I heard in my childhood church, I heard a sermon by a preacher saying that there's no such thing as gentle Jesus. That Jesus was radical, that Jesus was revolutionary, that Jesus came once and for all to sort out our weak and um, flawed human systems. But the more I get to know the Old Testament, the New Testament, the more I realize that Jesus had a very gentle side. And that he exposes God's tender, understanding, caring heart. <coughs> you see, we have Jesus in the most unexpected places. Firstly, he finds himself in a woman's womb just before he arrives here on earth. We find him in the back seats of Jerusalem, ministering to the vulnerable and to the marginalized. And then, shock, horror, we even find him nailed to a Roman cross. <coughs> in his three-year ministry and mission, as it unfolded, it looks like he constantly looked for the broken in society. That he constantly looked for the forgotten, for the forlorn. For those who were feeling sad and downtrodden. For those who sat drowning in their own pool of tears. And that is why, very appropriately, Jesus is the fulfillment of the Isaiah chapter 42 prophecy. So much so, it's proven by Matthew chapter 12. For there in Matthew chapter 12, not in the Psalms, in the New Testament, in the Gospels, in Matthew chapter 12, we have the Isaiah 42 passage repeated by Matthew as he writes his Gospel. It's like he wants to draw the reader's attention to Jesus living up to those words that had been spoken 600 years before. And so Matthew says to the reader, Open your eyes, everybody. Take 
a good look at this man named Jesus. He is the one of whom this prophecy was based. He is the one about whom God says, Here is my servant in whom I delight, the one I love, the one who I will fill with my spirit. And he's the one who would never break a bruised reed or snuff out a smoldering wick for that matter. So if we have only the miracle working Jesus in our minds, we need to twist that reality ever so slightly. For Jesus definitely had a soft tender, understanding, compassionate side as well. He wept with widows for goodness sake and he sat with sinners and he made the guilty feel like they could breathe again. And in a crazy step, he even allowed children to sit on his lap. Never before had the world seen love like that. And never after again, either. There are many people in this world who feel like loose dreams. And there are many people who I get to meet almost on a daily, weekly basis who feel like smoldering wicks. I was going to bring props to church today, but because of my mom's crisis, I couldn't. I didn't have the time. I got back to Amanda's late last night. Thanks, Mom, for being okay. And thank you for the sleepless night last night. But anyway, here I am doing what I need to do. I was going to bring some, some gimmicks to church today. I was going to stand here with a bruised reed in my one hand and with a smoldering wick in the other. So I don't have them here with me, so you're going to once again just see them in your mind's eye, okay? Bruce Reed, Smoldering Wick. And I want to ask the question today, have you ever felt like either of these that you see here in front of you? Have you ever felt like life has battered and beaten and bruised you to the extent that you feel like this reed that's not going to make it. Has life ever been so unjust, so unfair to you that you feel like a little flame which is bat battling to burn? Or perhaps it's not past tense for you. Perhaps that's not where you have been in the past. Perhaps that's where you are today. Struggling to survive. Drowning in your circumstances. I want to get one very clear point across to you this morning. And this is that Jesus' heart is a tender place. And if there's anybody in this building, you need to hear this good news today. You need to hear that Jesus is compassionate, that Jesus is caring, and that Jesus breaks into your life this morning, bringing you comfort and reassurance. The word speaks for itself. For if Jesus ever gets close to somebody who is like a bruised reed, he will deal with that person tenderly because he knows how easily we break. And if Jesus ever has the opportunity of looking after somebody who is like a smoldering wick, he will take extra care. To help that person. Do you need a little touch of God's grace this morning? If you do, I want to tell you that I know a, I know of a person. <coughs> Wait, let me correct that. Not I know of a person. I know a person. Because we're pretty tight. 
I know of a person whose love is taller than Mount Everest. I know of a person whose love is deeper than the Grand Canyon. I know of a person whose love is stronger than death itself. His name is Jesus. You see, compassion was always a big thing for Jesus because it is what defines his ministry and his mission for those three years. What examples can we use? Let's start with John chapter 8. Where Jesus sets free the woman caught in adultery. Not only does he deliver her from the stones of the Pharisees that were ready to kill her. He also delivers her from the shame and guilt that went with her situation. Another classic example of how important compassion was to Jesus is probably because he left us that parable in Luke chapter 10, the parable of the Good Samaritan. A controversial story for at the time, Jesus must have known that no average Jew would go close to an average Samaritan with a 10-foot pole. The two groups were enemies. So Jesus is wanting to emphasize this important point, that at the end of the day, compassion, matters. The ultimate example of Jesus' care probably reaches a climax on the cross of Calvary. For even as Jesus hand there between heaven and earth, he still scrapes together a last little bit of energy to offer care to Mary, his mother. It's the third thing he says from the cross. He says, woman, with his last breath, woman, there is your son. John, there is your mother. Even as he hung there in agonizing pain after having been tortured for 12 hours, he still uses whatever time he had access to. Whatever energy he had available to care for those who would be devastated by his death. Compassion seems to be his first and foremost priority. So those words ring true, very true in the life of Jesus. A smoldering wick you wouldn't dare break. And a smoldering wick, he wouldn't ever take the chance to snuff out. In fact, it looks like he does exactly the opposite. It looks like he builds up broken reeds and gives them new beginnings. It looks like he reignites a flame for somebody who feels like a smoldering wick. I'm never sure of the odds in church. Preaching is a little bit of a gamble because I never know if the theme I'm covering is for everybody at any given time. Let me, let me explain. So, so at my concerts, uh, I know that not everybody buys a program. So I have to print a certain amount of programs to not run at a loss. So I have come with a little bit of research to know that if, if there are 100 people 33 would buy a program, okay, because normally husband and wife would share. So that makes it 33% of the audience. Are you with me? I don't know what the odds would be at the church service. How many people are here today? Maybe 180 or so? I don't know the percentage of you needing to hear this message about bruised reeds and smoldering wicks. But let's take a wild guess. But let's say that 1% of you, that would be 18. Let's say that 1%, or perhaps at a push because Christmas is coming and some people really find that difficult, maybe 2% of you need to hear this. So that would be more or less 36 of you, give or take. And so I'm willing to take this chance 
to speak this message to you, hoping that deep within it will make a difference and plant hope where there currently is no hope at all. And perhaps we mustn't only talk about your pain. Perhaps we mustn't only talk about, about your suffering. Perhaps we must even start talking about what caused it in the first place. How helpful is it going to be for me to confidently point you to the Savior? Unless we also, perhaps not in great detail, but perhaps for us just to touch on what caused your pain in the first place. And that, that can be a multitude of stuff. Was it a death that has broken you? Was it somebody you loved very, very dearly, who died perhaps unexpectedly, and here you sit feeling like nothing else or nothing more than a bruised reed? If the death was unnatural, it would make your grief worse. Like a murder, for instance. Or can I take the risk of saying a suicide? How does one get over that stuff? Maybe you are sitting here feeling like a bruised reed years on because you haven't been able to come to terms with your heart soreness. Maybe your loss was even darker. Maybe it was a murder. Maybe it was a case where the body was never found. I don't want to just offer Jesus to you as healer and as friend and as guide. I want us to also every now and then dig a bit deeper. What has caused your heart to bleed? Perhaps it wasn't a death. Perhaps it was a poisonous divorce. Perhaps it was just that court case that lingered on and on and on. And there was just no... No truth to be found and you settled for terms that didn't really work for you. Maybe it wasn't a divorce. Maybe it was the fact that you never married. Could never find the right one. Or maybe it's just a gentle disappointment. Nothing that I could possibly think of to mention in the sermon today. Maybe somewhere along the line, maybe even this year, you have gone through a disappointment so harrowing that you haven't quite become yourself again. And here you sit, feeling like a smoldering wick, wondering whether you're going to survive or not. There might even be somebody in this building today who doesn't feel like a bruised reed. Perhaps you already feel like you've passed it, that you've really, already broken in two. And perhaps you even feel like your little wick is no longer smoldering, that it's been snuffed out and that there's nothing left. If that is the case, or maybe not 36 people present here today. If that is the case for only one person, I want you to know that Jesus meets you in your most profound need this morning. That He comes to you there where you are sitting, and while the world has thought that it's got rid of you, and just like they did with Him, shoved you into a borrowed tomb, thinking that you are done for good, that R.I.P. sign that they stuck up over Jesus' grave didn't stand for rest in peace. God's interpretation of R.I.P. is resurrection in progress. So I don't care if you feel spiritually dead. I don't care if you feel emotionally non-existent. 
I want you to hear that new life is possible for you today and now. And the Savior's love is going to sneak, seep into that dark corner there where you are writhing in your pain. And He's going to bring you all the rest. For He knows nothing else. His business is that of healing and restoration. <coughs> I don't want you to be nervous. If, you, if you're in that bruised grief category, if you're in that smoldering weak category, I don't want you to give up on yourself and I don't want you to be scared to come to Jesus, not being sure how He's going to receive you, not being sure what the result of that action might be. I want you to know that if you are feeling bruised or battered and beaten up today, I want you to know that He won't break you further. But that he will heal your hurt. That's not only a prophecy, that's a promise. And that if your light is burning faintly, you will rekindle that flame so that you can live a life of abundance. That's God's dream for you. And that, dear friends, that's the gospel. Jesus himself went through hurts and disappointments. Jesus himself felt heartbroken. Although it's the shortest verse in the Bible, it's probably the most loaded. John 11, verse 35, Jesus wept. Only two words, but they speak intense volumes of Jesus and his realness. For Jesus had lost his bestie. Lazarus got there too late. Jesus weeping tells us that it's okay to cry at the sad parts. <clears throat> when we hear Jesus' despair on the cross, we have to know once and for all that he relates to our brokenness. Remember that, that agonizing statement he makes, it's a sentence which ends with a crooked question mark. He says, my God, my God, you were supposed to be there for me. Why have you forsaken me? Jesus knows pain. And that's why he will never, ever deal with our pain lightly. And treat it casually. I want to say one more thing and then I'll end. I need to find a place for my parents for lunch, so I'm a bit under pressure. <laughs> um, my parents and my aunt and my cousin, so I need a table for five. Um, anyway, anyway. I just, want to, I just want to put a little bit of a disclaimer out there before I shut up. I'm not expecting this sermon to in one sweep bring healing to your suffering and an end to your struggle. I can't do magic. But what I can do is tell you of this person I know who is committed to your well-being, who is passionate about seeing your wounds being made whole, who will do everything in his power to dry your tears. Long ago, Isaiah said that this person would appear. Matthew stamped that in chapter 12, put a seal on it, saying, here he is, he is the one. I'm preaching the same truth to you today, saying that his name is Jesus.
My closing statement I want to make in another dramatic voice. Who shall we choose this time around? That, that whole Luciano Pavarotti thing didn't go anywhere, so no. Um, how about Judy Dench? Hey? Dame Judy Dench. I want you to hear this, these following words in her beautiful, haunting voice. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not snuff out. And in his arms, even suffering children are safe.